please give me a minute so that I may share my screen. Sorry about that one second. All right, are you all able to see? Please give a thumbs up. Yes, we do. All right, thanks again. Okay, thank you very much for joining us on the first day of the third Mekong Regional Land Forum. Today, our conversations focused on how we can advance the recognition of customary tenure rights and collective forest tenure in the region. I would like to share some of the key ideas and main takeaways that stood out to me. With the wealth of the discussion that we've had today, I must admit, it's not an easy task. During the plenaries and breakout groups, we learned about the diversity of customary forest tenure systems that have been practiced for generations by indigenous peoples and local communities throughout the Mekong region. We also learned about the different experiences and pathways being employed to document these systems so that they can be better recognized in order to improve local tenure security. The recording and documentation of customary tenure rights and practices is an essential step, but how can we then ensure that these are subsequently recognized and respected by external actors, such as other communities, government authorities, and the private sector, and also appropriately enshrined within statutory legal frameworks? It has been heartening to see that some progress, some significant progress has been made in the forest sector within our region. Over the last five years, we have seen in all Mekong countries, the enactment of new policy instruments, the creation of new multi-stakeholder mechanisms and partnerships, and an increasing recognition of the value that local communities and civil society can contribute in forest governance. The area of land recognized under various community-based management modalities has increased, and social forestry is slowly gaining wider acceptance as a viable cost-effective approach in climate change adaptation and mitigation, forest landscape restoration, rural livelihoods development, sustainable forest trade, and disaster risk reduction. These bright spots, as, as coined by Fanny, have provided an increasing number of opportunities for local people to understand, claim, exercise, and defend their rights over local forest land and resources as evidenced by the multitude of examples that we've shared today. But these examples also point to a number of key barriers and challenges that continue to inhibit communities from realizing a full spectrum of rights over their customary land. What are these immediate key barriers and how can we tackle them to turn the promise of new and emerging policy openings into successful practice? A recurrent message that I've heard today is that while countries have had success in passing new laws and legal instruments for forest tenure reform, it remains much more difficult to successfully implement these at scale. While it takes time to attune the mindsets of key actors, develop their capacities and mobilize networks of human and financial resources to new legislation, this is not the only reason. In many cases, the recognition of rights continues to remain partial, meaning that many legal frameworks don't recognize the full bundle of rights. They sometimes don't recognize the whole area of land where communities have been exercising the customary rights. They don't account for the full socio-ecological relationships that communities have with their forests and land. And they can also perpetuate some existing inequalities within communities. Income benefits also continue to be limited due to inadequate commercial rights and regulatory barriers that restrict market access. Our discussions today also show that many policies and procedures continue to be onerous to implement and place an unfair burden of responsibility on local communities. There remain significant imbalances of power between different actors. Women and other marginalized groups also continue to be significantly disadvantaged when it comes to recognizing their knowledge, needs, interests, and rights over forest spaces and resources. Therefore, a lot of work remains to be done in order to level the playing field, in particular to translate higher level policy law and laws into tools and processes that are accessible and implementable by rights holders on the ground, and also to ensure that there is equity and space for women and marginalized members from the communities to participate and make decisions that have a meaningful effect on their lives. A lot of this will require more learning and sharing with one another, both within and across Mekong countries. This is where communities of practice and mechanisms like this very forum can play an important role. Within the Mekong countries, we've seen evidence of how civil society networks and multi-stakeholder working groups can work to effectively coordinate efforts in tenure reform. 
The ASEAN Working Group on Social Forestry, the CSO Forum, and other regional platforms provide opportunities to share learning regionally, as well as to produce and adopt guidelines and protocols in line with international instruments, and also offer ways to follow the money, as Nonet said. The collaborative efforts being taken to develop an ASEAN regional policy framework for recognizing customary forest tenure holds great promise, but we must ensure that this remains practical and inclusive and that the progress and that the process engages the right key champions who are strategically positioned within ASEAN member states to push the agenda forward. Tomorrow afternoon session on the application of the existing ASEAN guidelines for responsible agricultural investment may present some useful lessons in this regard. One final point. In many Mekong countries, we are still grappling with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking ahead, there's a lot of talk among us in the development community about building back better towards a green recovery. On the other hand, governments may continue to see foreign direct investment as the best way to kickstart national economies. Flagged and Red Plus continue to also be important entry points driving forestry reform in all Mekong countries. And inevitably, there will also be other unforeseen setbacks and rollbacks, as Doris and David noted during their panel. In all these cases, we must continue to push for strong and clear rights for indigenous peoples and local communities to make sure that these are at the top of the agenda. And we must all work together to ensure that adequate attention and resources are invested and appropriately channeled to address customary rights as a capstone issue. Tomorrow, we will shift our discussions to focus on a key determining influence over how local tenure security is played out within Mekong countries. That is, how to manage and respond to patterns and practices of investment in Mekong forest landscapes. The morning session is aimed at demystifying the principles of free, prior, and informed consent. These principles are designed to protect the rights of communities to land and resources while also protecting investments by avoiding land conflicts. The afternoon session will highlight the potential effectiveness of tools such as the ASEAN guidelines for responsible agriculture investment in steering agribusiness investments in Mekong forest landscapes towards a more sustainable future. From what we have learned today, I hope we can enter tomorrow's discussion with a deepened appreciation of how the recognition of customary forest tenure remains an essential building block for FPIC and responsible investment practices in the Mekong. So there you have it. I've had my say. I encourage you to have yours. Please remember to um, take part in the poll today um, at www.